Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for that, Alan. Yeah, for, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Polly. I'm the Aquaculture Interactions Manager for Fisheries Management Scotland. Before I go any further, I just wanted to briefly touch on um, my role and what its purpose is. So my post has been put in place uh, to support our members, the boards and fisheries trusts, in working with the industry in managing aquaculture as it continues to grow across Scotland. Fisheries Management Scotland applied for the funding for Marine Scotland Science and Crown Estate Scotland for the role in anticipation of the changes of a new regulatory system. And we've been working to engage with the industry um, around aquaculture interactions um, with the aim of protecting wild fish and really changing the kind of conversations that are happening in this kind of space. I'm employed by Fisheries Management Scotland. So although there was a, a pandemic on last year, there was a, a series of significant changes um, in 2020 in relation to aquaculture interactions. And I want to spend some time reflecting on those and, and then spend some time looking to the future and, and what kind of things we can look forward to. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the Salmon Interactions Working Group. And this was really the most uh, kind of significant development last year um, in terms of uh, the way in which we, we consider and we discuss salmon interactions uh, it, it, between aquaculture and, and wild fish. So last April, following around 18 months of work, uh, key representatives within the wild fishery sector, the aquaculture industry and regulators came to a unanimous agreement on 42 recommendations for a better regulatory system for the protection of wild fish. The basis for this agreement came from a place of acceptance of the risks salmon farming interactions can place on wild fish and that the current system is not fit for purpose. So the key recommendations um, that came out of this group were really aimed at reforming the regulatory regime to make sure that the protection of wild fish was not just considered when a, a, when a farm application came through, but that it was considered all the way through the operations of the farm. And the way this will be done is through license conditions. So this means that there will be specific targets for farms to meet, um, and that will be reviewed on, on an ongoing basis throughout the production of the farm. This is really important as it gives us a framework in which to manage any interactions if they arise and uh, support our membership in, in managing that kind of liaison with the industry. Also in, uh, sees a, a license condition forming for uh, the monitoring of wild fish, which again will just make sure that there is that process in place for um, the fishery boards and trusts to understand what is going on in, in the wild um, and then have that kind of feedback loop into the aquaculture industry and understand any impacts and put in, into place any specific changes that are necessary. At the moment, there aren't um, any strict uh, sea lice or escape uh, enforcement sanctions. So at the moment, sea lice um, enforcement comes mainly from the code of good practice. Um, which sets the levels at 0.5 sea lice per fish during the sensitive period, so when the, the smolt migration is running, and one um, for the rest of the year. The Scottish Government levels are actually set at 3 and 6 at the moment, which is significantly higher, and so this will aim to set those levels at a more appropriate level and, and, and uh, place a, a, a strict limit on, on the farm's operations rather than what's in place at the moment. It is also not currently an offence to have an escape from a, a salmon farm, um, just an, uh, an offence to not report one through the formal channels. So one of the key recommendations was that 100% of uh, farm fish should stay in production uh, facilities and also things like making sure there is a mitigation plan for an escapes, making sure there is monitoring in place for if an escape does happen um, and that, that the appropriate kind of fines that are related to an escape to try and ensure that, that, that they're simply not happening. The, the report also recommended that we need a real understanding of migration routes. And this is not just for, uh, you know, this is not just useful for aquaculture and the, and the pressures that can come from that, but it's important that we understand where the fish are migrating, how they're moving, and what kind of interactions they're gonna come into contact with. And things like the wild, uh, uh, the West Coast Tracking Project um, will be really key in informing that sort of information base. The other thing that was recommended to come out of this was a, a spatial planning model for consenting. So this is a tool that's aimed to inform planners um, on areas of, of high risk in relation to the impacts on wild fish from aquaculture and areas where development can continue in a sustainable fashion. 
And this is really important because at the moment we just simply don't know where where the areas of really high risk may be and, and where, where they're not happening. Um, so we really want to see that pushed forward. These recommendations are fundamental for uh, mitigating wild fisheries impacts um, and improving relationships between the sectors. And both sectors unanimously agreed and supported on these recommendations. So it's really disappointing that as yet we don't have a, a response from the Scottish Government on this. Fisheries Management Scotland and our members continue to push for full enforcement of these recommendations. Um, similarly, we still do not have the spatial planning model. Um, and it's, it's hugely frustrating because there are a number of, uh, of new farms and expansions still coming through the planning system. And it's very hard to manage that process um, in this kind of no man's land in between regulatory systems. So environmental management plans uh, were, were uh, recommended by the government in 2019 for, following the Rural and Economy Committee's uh, uh, inquiry. They're a, a, a planning condition which is aimed to be in place for all existing farms and um, any, any new farms coming through the system. And they represent a, um, a, a plan and a process by which boards and trusts agree with the, the local operators um, to, to monitor um, and, and mitigate, if necessary, any impacts from specific farms. These, um, these offer a chance for adaptive management, so we can see for, from both sides where changes need to happen on, on the wild fisheries monitoring side of view and also from a, on a, on a farm-specific basis. Over the last year, I and the members have been working through a number of these environmental management plans to establish them with companies, and they offer a really good source of engagement with the industry. However, whilst we wait for the regulatory system, they are just a stopgap whilst that, before that comes into play. Ultimately, we want to be at a place where there are no salmon es escaping from salmon farms on, on the west coast of Scotland. Unfortunately, there were several in 2020. Given the timing and the location of, of one specific escape and that a number of fish started to appear in the River Leven, we decided to take the opportunity to monitor where these farm fish were entering the rivers and try and get some kind of verification on, on anglers' identification. So we set up a project by which anglers could report their uh, catches of suspected farm fish and provide uh, uh, scales of the salmon, which we could then be used to distinguish between a wild and a farmed fish. So from this, there were 295 uh, records of confirmed, so that's verified using scale samples, um, farm fish across the west coast of, of Scotland and England across 17 rivers. And by looking at the scales, we were able to confirm that there was an at least a 95% accuracy rate from anglers in terms of identifying these farm fish. The next step from this, now we have an idea of where, where farm fish are turning up, is to understand whether there's any uh, specific impact on the genetic uh, integrity of wild salmon stocks. So as a result, we've set up a genetic monitoring plan, which will look at key areas impacted by this escape to ensure um, that we understand what the impacts might be. However, what this escape has really highlighted is that it's a significant workload for Fisheries Management Scotland and our members to be able to manage an escape of this size and that we are also conscious there are, are numerous other escapes happening. At the moment, there is not a strategic kind of um, plan in which to manage these escapes. And whilst the Salmon Interactions Working Group recommendations um, set out a kind of plan of action for that, we're working with the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation to try and start those conversations about what we can do to monitor escapes on a national scale and ensure that we understand the full impacts. I want to briefly give an update on the Aquaculture Stewardship Council um, because this is becoming increasingly prevalent in Scotland um, with one producer in particular having a number of sites um, enter the programme and significant goals for all of their sites to be, to be part of the programme in, in just a number of years. The Aquaculture Stewardship Council is a certification scheme aimed at indicating to consumers a sustainably sourced farmed seafood product. These standards go through regular reviews um, and they're expected to improve the standards, so raise the bar continually to ensure that that kind of gradual improvement of the whole sector is, is ongoing. As these new sites are entering um, into the programme from, from one particular producer organisation, Myself and the members are, are working to engage with the Aquaculture Stewardship Council process through the assessment body to make sure that we're providing constructive feedback 
about what the, the, the situation is with the local farm and work with that producer organisation because this is something that we want to support. The Aquaculture Stewardship Council is the only standard that considers wild fishery impacts. So whilst there are many, many others out there, this is the one that we're really, really focused on. Alongside the site specific stakeholder engagement, the Aquaculture Stewardship Council are currently going through a review of one of the key indicators for us, which is on sea lice. So at the moment, sea lice levels, if you're um, within the Aquaculture Stewardship Council program, is limited to 0.1 adult sea lice per fish, which is quite, quite considerably lower than the 0.5 that is um, required by the Code of Good Practice. So it is a major concern to us that the ASC are proposing to increase that sea lice level in line with local regulations. Now, as I mentioned earlier in Scotland, there's the Code of Good Practice levels and then there's the Scottish Government enforcement levels, but and we're, we're not quite clear how it's going to fit with either one of those, but it means an increase from 0.1 to at least 0.5 sea lice per adult fish during the sensitive period. So we will, we will be objecting to this change. And I think if the Agriculture Stewardship Council were to, to take that forward from the consultation phase it's in now into a, a, a fixed standard, we would really struggle to support the standard on, on an ongoing basis. So looking to the future then, we've got quite a number of areas that we really want to focus on, we really want to concentrate on. Um, the, as I mentioned, the Salmon Interactions Working Group recommendations really need to be taken forward to create that regulatory system that will allow the space for, for aquaculture and wild fisheries to work together to ensure there are no impacts on, on wild fish. We've also got projects such as the West Coast Tracking Project that are kicking off um, almost as we speak um, in terms of um, monitoring where these wild fish are, are are migrating through our, our kind of West Coast system and, and beyond, and that will be key to understanding what's going on. And related to that is the uh, spatial planning framework, which will kind of give us an impression of where there will be these really high areas of, of likely sea lice interaction with wild fish, and where we need to make sure that there is no further development, and where other areas may be more, more prime for that kind of level of development. We're also seeing that this year a kind of um, a, an exciting development in the form of a, a potential semi-closed containment facility. And while we have to apply due diligence to this site, it's an exciting prospect to think that Scotland could be heading in that direction and we're keen to see how this progresses. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to take questions at the at the end of the session.